<clears throat> the Chinese Revolution is one of the greatest events in human history, in the course of which, which spanned really over two decades, if you want to encompass the whole process. The world's largest country was turned upside down, social relations were transformed, uh, and the country was finally freed from the humiliation of Western imperialism. And also the revolution stands as an enormous validation of the theories of historical materialism in general and permanent revolution in particular. Because despite the peculiarities of the Chinese Communist Party's line and what I would consider to be a mistaken position pretty much throughout the course of the two decades of the revolution, despite that, the revolution was still victorious, and I think that really underlines the objective necessity uh, of revolution uh, in that particular country. And the revolution was peculiar, um, really peculiar, for two particular reasons. First of all, uh, it did not take place in the, no in the sort of typical uh, working class way, you know, that we might expect uh, as Marxists, in which an urban proletariat organizes itself and, and stages uh, mass demonstrations and ultimately an insurrection. That did not take place. Uh, the revolution, when it was victorious, came in from a peasant army from the countryside uh, which surrounded the cities and, and then conquered power, which is highly peculiar. And secondly, also, uh, the other reason it was peculiar was the, the fact, as I've mentioned, that the Chinese Communist Party's line throughout the revolution was kind of almost a non-revolutionary line. Uh, even up until the eve of taking power, they pretty much opposed uh, taking power uh, and said that they didn't plan to abolish capitalism, e even if they did take power. And yet both of these things uh, took place. So the revolution really began in the 1920s. Uh, and the, the Chinese Communist Party was extremely young at that point. It was formed officially in 1921. Uh, and at that point, it was a kind of a classical Marxist party, if you like, basing itself on the working class in the cities. In fact, it established the, the trade unions that within a few years would go on to be uh, mass organizations that were leading that particular revolution in the mid-1920s. Uh, however, the line that was given to this young Chinese Communist Party by its parent organization in Moscow uh, was unfortunately uh, an extremely bad one, essentially. Stalin insisted that the, there was no way the Chinese working class could come to power uh, and that the Chinese Communist Party could only facilitate uh, a bourgeois revolution. That, you know, China hadn't had its bourgeois revolution like Britain and France and therefore it was the role simply to be the handmaiden to that, to passively support, essentially, the Guomindang and Chiang Kai-shek, which was the, the Nationalist Party and its leader. Uh, and, and this was a completely false line that Trotsky pointed out, and, and this was proven in practice when, in 1927, Chiang Kai-shek betrayed his uh, supporters in the Communist Party and massacred them in their thousands and dro drove them out of the cities. And the reason for this, Trotsky explained, that the Chinese capitalist class was not a revolutionary class, as in many other colonial countries. It was a, a class that was created by imperialism and, and really a servant of imperialism. It had no interest in kicking out the imperialists and, and, and establishing democracy. And so it proved. Uh, and, and the revolution was totally botched as a result. Uh, and and the, the defenceless Communist Party fled into the surrounding countryside. Now, you will meet today many people, in particular Maoists, who will tell you that this, that Maoism uh, is, a, is a kind of genius adaptation of Marxism to Chinese characteristics because it understood that you know, this is a, a rural economy, it's a peasant society largely, and therefore uh, it was brilliant to change Marxism and to base itself on the peasantry and that essentially he, he foresaw this. Well, I hope to explain in the course of this discussion why uh, that line was, was mistaken, uh, even though they did come to power. Uh, but also I'd just like to point out at this point how it was not an, uh, not an anticipation on Mao's part. Uh, even up until 1935, that is almost 10 years after they were massacred and fled into the countryside, the f official position of the Communist Party was that they were to return to the cities and the working class was to lead the revolution. Uh, and they only stayed in the countryside because, uh, basically, of, of the mistakes that they made following Stalin's orders, essentially. 
uh, prevented that created an obstacle to returning to the cities and they basically adapted to the countryside to the rural conditions um, and although it may seem as if it was successful uh, it very nearly was absolutely disastrous uh, for the Chinese Communist Party in fact in 1934 they had to flee their initial rural base in the south of the country because they were about to be destroyed by uh, Chiang Kai-shek's uh, military and, and, and go on the famous long march in which they marched from one length of the country to the other, uh, in which 90% of the membership died. So, you know, the entire party was very nearly absolutely wiped out in the, and, and really probably would have been if it weren't for the Second World War. Um, and, and, and with this or that uh, uh, minor alteration, essentially the Communist Party maintained the same line uh, even up until 1949. In other words, they supported Chiang Kai-shek, essentially, um, uh, claiming that he, you know, he was a patriot in the struggle against the Japanese. In fact, in 1937, when the war with Japan started, um, they actually f t um, organized a pact with Chiang Kai-shek at gunpoint. I don't have t t time to go into the bizarre details of that affair. Uh, but they organized a pact with Chiang Kai-shek. They managed to capture him, essentially. And instead of killing him, which they probably should have done, they said, um, you know what, why don't, even though you're the dictator of China who's been massacring us in tens of thousands, why don't we join our forces together and fight Japan in a great patriotic uh, war, if you like. Uh, and at the time, they said the following. The aggression of imperialist Japan can only be overcome by the internal unity of our nation. All our fellow countrymen, Every single zealous de de descendant of Huangdi, that is the first Chinese emperor, must determinedly and relentlessly participate. And Mao stressed, it is a united front of the whole nation, of all parties, groups, and classes. So they continued essentially with Stalin's line of, in other words, supporting the bourgeoisie, class collaboration policies essentially, um, you know, denying their own independent role as a communist party. Um, and, uh, uh, and the fact that you know, they were able then to, to actually have a, a, another crack at it with another revolution in 1949 in which they were successful, you might think that that shows um, that this was the correct line. I would argue the opposite. I would argue that it was precisely the erroneousness of this line. It was precisely how uh, utterly counter-revolutionary and reactionary the Chiang Kai-shek regime was that they were able to come to power. So the fact they came to power actually proved the opposite of what they were saying. Um, and, um, uh, but this, the Chinese Communist Party didn't recognize this throughout this period. And, and it made enormous sacrifices in, in, in both the, the war with Japan and in the civil war. And it was kind of, it's like the objective circumstances were so revolutionary, if you like, uh, that the, or the need for revolution was so great that a revolutionary role was kind of imposed onto the Communist Party, even against their will. I'll give a couple of examples to demonstrate that. So in 1941, in the middle of the war, only four years after they signed this pact with Chiang Kai-shek, um, in which they basically gave him everything. Uh, they, you know, they promised to not only support him, but they promised to give over control of their own armed forces to his generals, for example. Um, they promised to change the name of their armed forces to a more neutral, less communist name, etc. Many other examples. But only four years after this, in which, by the way, Chiang Kai-shek's regime did nothing to fight the Japanese even after this pact. They abandoned 15 of 18 provinces. In doing so, killing thousands of their own people by, um, by a kind of scorched earth policy in which they would just destroy the countryside so that when the Japanese got there, there was nothing to use. So it was an absolutely disgraceful... Uh, 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 you know, for a so-called nationalist party, which is what they are, apparently. It was a disgraceful position. But by in 1941, there was the new Fourth Army incident um, in which the Guomindang forces turned on Chinese Communist Party forces and, 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 and killed them uh, in, a few th in, in thousands and, and completely destroyed that particular army, betraying their pact. And now you might think that what the effect that that would have had would be to discredit the Chinese Communist Party in the eyes of many Chinese people because they were promoting Chiang Kai-shek, saying that he was a patriot and their ally in the struggle with China. 
And this surely, at least from our point of view as Marxists, we think, well, surely that's an embarrassment for them because it's completely disproven their position. But in truth, it led to the opposite because the hatred of Chiang Kai-shek was so deep in Chinese society that it just led to sympathy for the Communist Party. Basically, people thought, yeah, you are the people who are, want to fight Japan. And look, Chiang Kai-shek's turned on you and killed you. Um, I'll give another example. After the, um, after the end of the Second World War, um, obviously there was an end of hostilities and no one was quite sure what was going to go on between the Communist Party and the, the Guomindang regime. Uh, the, the Chinese Communist Party once again was keen to sign a truce um, so that there wouldn't be a civil war or at least the civil war wouldn't break out immediately. Uh, and so such a truce was signed in 1946 at the Chinese Communist Party's initiative, I stress. Uh, and in this time, once again, they, they, they kind of um, associated themselves uh, and with the Chiang Kai-shek regime and in a certain sense promoted it. In fact, Zhou Enlai, who is one of the major leaders of the Chinese Communist Party, um, actually took on the position, an appointed position of Deputy Minister of Political Training, which had no real power behind it, but all of the association, all, you got all the responsibility for the crimes of the dictatorship of Chiang Kai-shek for taking on that role. It's the exact opposite of what you should, you should be doing. Um, and they also uh, launched the political People's Political Consultative Conference, which was essentially a kind of uh, pseudo-parliament, uh, I say pseudo because it wasn't even elected, uh, in which all of the parties of China, in reality there were only two meaningful parties, the Guomindang and the Chinese Communist Party, but all these other tiny little parties of you know, liberals basically who, who had no membership, they were invited to this conference and the number of delegates was selected in advance by the parties themselves. So it was completely undemocratic. No one got, the ordinary people had no say in this whatsoever. And it was supposed to discuss how they could kind of gradually move towards democracy. Um, and so they, and once again, they were kind of associating themselves with the regime. If you compare that to the policies of the Bolsheviks, uh, for example, in, under the Tsar, uh, for, occasionally the Tsar would organize an, another kind of sham parliament uh, in which, you know, it, it was just a rubber stamp parliament. It had no power whatsoever. He remained, obviously, uh, an autocrat. Well, but but when, when these were organised, sometimes the Bolsheviks did participate in elections to them. But they never took on the responsibility for these parliaments. And, the only, and it, was, it caused a lot of controversy within the Bolsheviks. And they did often boycott them as well. But what they would do is they, they, they understood that because there were actually elections to these parliaments, they would participate in those elections as a means of you know, gaining an echo in the working class because the working class did actually vote in these, uh, in, in these elections and so they felt it was necessary to participate to get their name out there. But then they always exposed that this was a fake parliament, you know, the, the Tsar needed to be overthrown, etc. Uh, whereas in, in China, they took the initiative to create such a, a parliament uh, and then um, having created it, uh, it was created in an undemocratic way as well. So it wasn't even the, the one element of democracy that you had in the case of the, uh, Russia. So I think, again, a completely false policy. And yet again, Chiang Kai-shek betrayed this. In 1947, he broke the truce uh, and, and started the civil war. So it was Chiang Kai-shek that started the civil war, not the Chinese Communist Party. And again, they got sympathy for that. Uh, because ba basically people were looking, people were projecting onto the Communist Party, you know, what they wanted it to do. Uh, they wanted it to fulfil a revolutionary role. They saw it as revolutionary despite its actions. Um, so why did, why did uh, Chiang Kai-shek break that truce and why did the civil war start? And, you know, given that he lost it within only two years, you might think it was a, a, fool a foolish move. And indeed it was a foolish move. He was a foolish man, to be honest. Uh, probably one of the most inept uh, leaders uh, you will ever read about. Um, the main reason that he broke uh, the truce was um, that he could not tolerate the existence, didn't matter what its behaviour was, he could not tolerate the existence of something called the Communist Party with thousands and thousands of members with arms and occupying territory. And to be honest, any bourgeois re regime would not tolerate that. Can you imagine if there was a Communist Party that occupied Wales uh, armed to the teeth. I don't think the British state would tolerate that for very long. But obviously he was also a dictator and dictators are not generally known for their toleration of uh, different political tendencies. So to be honest, it was inevitable he was going to break it and it was naive of the Communist Party to, 
uh, to, to offer him that truce. Um, however, um, he also uh, has to be said, um, oh, where is that? Um, maybe I'm skipping ahead. Um, yeah, I'm skipping ahead. But anyway, that was one of the reasons that he ended the, uh, that he ended the truce and began the war. So why did he lose the civil war so, so rapidly then? Um, well, first of all, we have to consider the enormous, uh, unbelievable levels of corruption and rottenness that his regime represented. And he, he represented this because he, it, was, it was really the continuation, although the events of 1911 and the, and the 1920s had changed the regime, the, you know, the, 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 the last emperor, uh, um, that, that, that ended in 1911. But in reality, he represented a continuation of this, um, and that the same old rotten ruling class that had been, you know, that had capitulated the country to Western imperialism, um, and was thoroughly, thoroughly discredited. He represented a capitalist class that had no perspective, that had no interest in developing the means of production, no interest in, in competing on the world market. It was a corrupt class uh, that was created essentially by Western imperialism and got rich simply by, really by looting the country, uh, uh, you know, in, in, uh, in, and trading with the West. Um, I mean, under his watch, there, was, there were constant economic crises. There were constant famines. There was a famine in 1942 to three, which killed millions of people. Inflation was absolutely out of control. Prices rose two, uh, two and a half thousand times during the war. Uh, living standards for workers on average fell by a half. Um, and for some workers fell by 90%. In fact, for the more middle class professions, they fell particularly far. Um, so it was a, a deeply hated and discredited regime. Um, and, what's in, and also there's endless absurd taxes that were just laid on to workers and especially peasants. Uh, and really backwards reactionary taxes from, from feudal days, essentially. For example, there was the Lichen or Lichen tax, uh, which, you know, um, you would have to pay a tax to transport goods from one part of the country to the other. So, you know, kind of like a feudal kind of tax between different principalities, um, which is, you know, very, uh, um, very much depresses trade, as you can imagine. Um, and there was also other tax, like the contribute sandals to, to war recruits tax, the comfort recruits families tax. These are the actual, they just invented taxes for everything that they needed, and it just proliferated and proliferated. Um, and, you know, the, although people, again, people will tell you that it was correct uh, of Mao to base themselves in the countryside because, you know, the peasantry is really the equivalent of the working class in a country like China. That's what people say. But actually, there were mass movements in the cities throughout this time that, unfortunately, the Communist Party had very little relation to. There were mass student movements throughout the war and throughout the civil war. Um, you know, enormous, of, a, of an enormous scale, not just sort of like what we might expect in, in, in Britain occasionally, like, you know, earth shattering, staggering of uh, size, very revolutionary. There was also many, many strike waves, um, in particular towards the, the, the time of the overthrow of the regime. For example, in two, uh, 1936, there were 278 strikes recorded nationwide. By 1946, 10 years later, there were 1,716 strikes in Shanghai alone. Uh, and in 1947, a year later in Shanghai alone, there was 2,538 strikes. And Doak Barnett, who wrote a good book about uh, going, he was a journalist who went across the country um, on the eve of, of, of the revolution, he quoted a Shanghai newspaper editor who said the following, nobody can control the trade unions in Shanghai right now. The government is extremely weak and wary about the possibility of antagonizing labor, even though trade unions were illegal. And union members, together with their families, uh, include over half of the population of Shanghai. The sheer size of the labor movement makes some people in Shanghai apprehensive about it. So basically, there was a mass and militant working class movement. Uh, but unfortunately, the, working, the, the Chinese Communist Party wasn't able to connect with it. In fact, they actually discouraged it. They essentially said, listen, we're organizing the country, uh, the, the, the struggle in the countryside. Just wait for us, basically. We're doing it for you, essentially, is the line uh, that they put across. Um, but it, it had they, had they in, in, in the beginning of the Civil War, had the Chinese Communist Party issued a call to the workers of China saying, 
you know, if you, you should help us come to power by organizing a general strike uh, and to bring down this rotten regime. Uh, I am absolutely convinced that the, the regime would have collapsed like that. It was that discredited, that unpopular. Um, you know, a vast proportion of society hated, hated the regime. And with the military and the countryside to back them up as well, the, the Red Army, I think it would have undoubtedly been successful. Um, but yeah, they, unfortunately, they failed to connect with this. In fact, when they did recruit workers and students in the cities, they would actually take them out of the cities into the countryside to help them in that struggle. So they, they really failed to build a base in the cities. But, um, <clears throat> and of course, the civil war is the most political of all wars. It's the, it's the kind of war in which the class struggle has the most direct bearing. And so it's not surprising that this, this, this social crisis affected the regime and affected its capacity to fight the Communist Party, and not just because generally it was very, very unpopular, which politically weakened it, but also this had a reflection in the military. And of course, any military, certainly any military of the ruling class, is like a mirror of society. It has all the social contradictions of society within the army. In other words, the rank and file of the army is typically working class or peasant based. And of course, the leaders are much richer, probably from the ruling class. And, uh, in a, and therefore, if the ruling class is a thoroughly rotten and corrupt one with no future, then that would be reflected, you would expect to find that reflected in the army as well. And indeed, it was the case. So this is another reason that uh, Chiang Kai-shek uh, star uh, started the civil war, was because he was overconfident, because, because of the, he had a five to one numerical advantage in troops. Um, and uh, he actually received $60 billion of aid in today's money from the United States. Uh, half of it was aid uh, and half of it was actually um, uh, weapons. Uh, and so he had a very mo modern military, actually. So he was overconfident. He thought he could easily um, destroy the Communist Party. And he certainly had initial successes when he broke the truce. Initially, they had some, some big military successes, although these were misleading because in reality, the Communist Party, which was adept at um, guerrilla warfare by this point, didn't really suffer many losses in these, these defeats. They just kind of melted into the countryside as they were so good at doing. Um, but he was, over, he was overconfident because uh, it, these, these figures, this five to one figure, in reality, well, first of all, as I said, a civil war is a political war. And, and of course, if your rank and file has absolutely no desire to fight for you, don't believe in the struggle. In fact, if they despise you, then they're not going to be very effective fighters. Um, and indeed, they weren't, they couldn't be effective fighters because of the way they were treated. First of all, um, it was widespread, first of all, yeah, it was widespread that officers would uh, under-recruit, under essentially. So basically, they could claim uh, the wages, they would be given an, uh, uh, an expected number of people to recruit, and they could claim the wages for all of those people. So what these officers would do, and of course they were corrupt, I mean everyone was corrupt, it was normal in the ruling class, so why wouldn't they be? They would only recruit about 60 to 70% of the numbers allocated to them, and then they would just keep the rest of that money for themselves. Uh, of course, all, any wealthy family, and you didn't have to be that wealthy, uh, could avoid conscription by bribing people. So actually, the army was only about 60% of its advertised strength. So suddenly, a 5 to 1 numerical advantage is more like a 3 to 1 numerical advantage. Um, and because the well-off could avoid uh, conscription, of course, the army was composed of the particularly poor layers. And they were, indeed, they were very poor, and they were very ill and underfed and appallingly treated. The recruits uh, to the army would be rounded up from villages, literally with ropes tied around their necks, and marched to the, the training bases. Uh, they had their clothing taken off them so that they couldn't escape. The officers would frequently steal their food in order to sell it on and make even more money. And they wouldn't be given water. They had to drink from roadside puddles, which would frequently lead to illness, as you can imagine. But they were denied medical treatment until they actually got to the training base. They, they weren't officially soldiers until they got there. And they were expected to walk on this march in which they were tied by the neck, hundreds or even thousands in some cases of kilometers. So unsurprisingly, a huge number never even made it. In fact, by some estimates, almost half of them died or fled before they even got to the training bases. So, you know, it's not, it wasn't exactly, again, it's five to one advantage on paper. In reality, it was barely even a numerical advantage. 
And in fact, the, the, the Guomindang's army under Chiang Kai-shek in the Civil War suffered probably the most desertions of any army in history, partly for the reasons I've described, obviously, the, 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 the appalling way they were treated, but also because of, and we have to here be, be positive about some of the, the positions of the Communist Party, because of their genius position, which they could offer because of the fact that they did have, they did control parts of the countryside. They offered um, any soldier who defected from the Guomindang to them a plot of land. And of course, most of these soldiers were landless peasants. So to be offered a plot of land to desert a regime that you despise anyway is quite an attempting offer. So you can imagine that a lot of them would have deserted. Um, and actually, so I should also explain that whilst the Communist Party occupied these rural bases, which they had been doing ever since 1928, they had practiced land reform. So they had given land, essentially, to landless peasants from rich peasants, which, of course, made them enormously <coughs> popular. Although we have to be realistic about this, it was very moderate land reform. And today, again, you'll see Maoists celebrating this, saying that you know, Mao was this amazing guy who fought the landlords. Actually, most of the time they were in these rural bases, they didn't really fight the landlords. Um, partly because their political line, as I said, wasn't actually that revolutionary, but also mainly for survival. Because they were forced into the countryside, they had to rely upon, they, couldn't, they didn't have an, an industrial urban base to, to provide them uh, with the equipment that they needed. So in order to get that equipment, they had to trade, essentially. And to trade with the cities, they needed to keep the, the, the merchants with the right connections uh, and the richer landlords who produced food more, more abundantly. They had to keep them sweet, essentially, in order to be able to s survive, essentially. So actually, they, although on, they said they did a lot of land reform, the land reform was pretty moderate, actually. Usually, it was constantly varying in degree how, how radical it was. Uh, but it was, in general, it was pretty moderate, uh, and they didn't end landlordism where they were based. However, it was far more than what the Guomindang was doing, which was a regime, essentially, of landlords and warlords. So, you know, it was an enormous, in, in the eyes of, of, of Chinese peasants, this was an enormously progressive and exciting thing. They didn't have to do that much to stand out, essentially. Um, and that paid dividends for them in the, in the Civil War. I should also explain that Mao was also, I think, a tactical genius in the Civil War. I think the political line was, was pretty weak, as I've said. Um, but the, 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 the tactics of how to fight a Civil War or, or how to fight guerrilla warfare were fantastic. Uh, and the, they were, they were, there are many examples of amazing battles that they fought in which they were hugely outnumbered. But they were very good at being flexible, at moving very quickly, at concentrating their forces very effectively in certain weak spots of the enemy and defeating them. Um, whereas the Guomindang leaders were craven, lazy, brutal, all the things I've described. Uh, they, they treated their own soldiers appallingly, as you know. Um, and, and they generally weren't prepared to fight. In fact, being a warlord's regime, it, which is ironic because he was a nationalist and Chiang Kai-shek was supposed to, you know, the, the bourgeois revolution is supposed to create the nation state. It's supposed to knock down feudal barriers. But actually, uh, he found himself having to rely upon the old warlords as the, because he was basically the candidate of anyone who wanted to destroy the Communist Party. That was his, his role in society. So he based himself on the most reactionary layers, the warlords. And so actually the country fell back into, into warlordism, um, which was a huge step backwards. And that also inhibited both the war against Japan and, uh, and the civil war, because these warlords often didn't want to fight. They wouldn't even allow the forces of the Guomindang into their province. Um, so so it was a pr that also undermined uh, their efforts. By 1948, the C Chinese Communist Party was able to move from guerrilla warfare into positional warfare, uh, meaning you know, occupying large cities uh, and defending them. Um, and to be honest, this was astonishingly easy by this point. There were so many defections that they actually had a numerical advantage. And um, uh, they just took city after city because it was just abandoned, essentially, especially in Manchuria, which were the first cities they took in the north of the country. Uh, the Guomindang just abandoned key cities like Beijing, Tianjin, and, and, uh, and then further down south in Nanjing, Nanjing. And the only big city that really did put up any resistance to the Communist Party was Shanghai. But even then, that fought uh, terribly because the officers just kept everyone in a rigid formation. So although they had a numerical advantage, when the Communist Party attacked one part of the city, all of the soldiers stationed in different parts of the city would just stay put. 
they wouldn't move into that area. So they, they also defeated them quite easily there. So yes, it was a thoroughly corrupt uh, and discredited regime. However, many regimes that get overthrown, in fact, probably all re regimes that get overthrown in revolutions are thoroughly corrupt and discredited. So why, why was it so... Um, a, why was the Communist Party able to overthrow them in this peculiar way from the countryside, um, which you can't normally do, to be honest? Um, well, first, I think the main thing here is uh, the existence of World War II, which is a rather exceptional circumstance, I'm sure you will agree. Um, World War II created a very chaotic and unpredictable situation. And it was a situation in which all of the major capitalist powers of the world, you know, Germany, Britain, America, Japan, were tearing each other to pieces, essentially. And no one could predict what the outcome of that would be. And capitalism kind of came close to being destroyed. Uh, the Soviet Union was able to massively increase its power and sweep in all the way to, um, to Central Europe, in fact, even taking parts of Germany, which is an astonishing development that, that, that nobody predicted. Um, and, and really, in a sense, you could say a similar thing happened in China. Um, uh, I think Japan invading China really, in a sense, ironically rescued the Communist Party. It distracted, I, to be honest, I think they were about to be destroyed by the Guomindang. As I said, 90% of them had died in the Long March, which was in, ended in 1935, so only two years before Japan fully invaded. And, um, uh, but by invading, it completely distract, distracted the Guomindang. It massively discredited the Guomindang because it was so pathetic at fighting Japan and didn't really want to fight them and it was quite obvious that that was the case um, and um, and the, the, so the Communist Party again had this role kind of almost forced upon them I mean they were very admittedly to their credit they were very loud about wanting to fight Japan but to be honest they actually very rarely did fight Japan because they didn't have the capacity to and a couple of instances where they did actually launch battles against the Japanese they got absolutely smashed but that obviously won them a lot of credit amongst Chinese people. So at least someone is standing up to these, these imperialists. So um, that really, I think, did uh, rescue them. And there was a very specific thing that came out of it, which is that uh, right at the end of the war, when Japan was about to be defeated, uh, the Soviet Union suddenly declared war on Japan. And it invaded Manchuria, the part of China that, uh, that Jap the Japanese had particular strength in. And, and within about two weeks had fully taken it over. And in doing so, they, ca they captured 700,000 uh, Japanese weapons, both heavy and light weapons, which they gave over entirely to the Chinese Communist Party, which was obviously an enormous boost. And to be honest, if that wasn't given to them, it's very likely that they wouldn't have been able to win the war. So that, that's clearly not a generalizable thing. You can't generally say, well, Mao was correct. We can launch kind of s revolutionary civil wars from the countryside all over the world. Uh, and, then, and, and, and to do so, we'll just get 700,000 weapons from the Soviet Union. That's not a normal <laughs> circumstance. Um, it was a very exceptional situation. And finally, it also meant that America was not able to intervene. Uh, America was exhausted by the war. It, it had fought a war on two fronts, uh, and it had won, of course, uh, and there was no real appetite for, for opening up a second front. Um, if you look at where similar guerrilla struggles were attempted in Latin America and in Africa, uh, the, the CIA quite effectively intervened uh, from the beginning to nip them in the bud, especially after the experience of Cuba. And, um, and that's actually how Che Guevara died in, in Bolivia. Uh, so in general, they found it qu quite easy to, to sort of get rid of guerrilla struggles when they had the energy and the resources to do so. But on a country the size of China, when they had just fought the biggest war in history, they weren't really prepared to do so. And that combined with the rottenness of the, the Chiang Kai-shek regime, which they realized. I mean, the Americans were tearing their hair out at Chiang Kai-shek. In fact, they were even proposing that he form a coalition government with the communists, because they thought, well, they, you know, well, first of all, they didn't really believe the communists were real communists. In fact, there's various wires from P people in the CIA saying, yeah, but they're not, they're not real communists, so they're fine. Um, but also they thought uh, they just had no other option. They just thought Chiang Kai-shek was an utter joke. Um, and basically to, to win the war against uh, the Communist Party, America would have had to have intervened in a full way like they did in Vietnam, you know, with hundreds of thousands of troops. And obviously this would have been like Vietnam times 100 because China is absolutely immense. Um, and in fact, this is also proven by the fact they couldn't even w win the war in Korea only a, a, couple, a few years later. So 
Um, that essentially is how the regime fell, and they, 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 in quite a sort of straightforward manner in the end, in 1948 and 9, they just kind of marched into these cities uh, with no real resistance. Uh, and in a kind of final, uh, final act of, of, of corruption, if you like, just to prove how, how rotten they were, uh, Chiang Kai-shek and the leading members of the bourgeoisie, his crony capitalists, fled the country into Taiwan. That's the reason that Taiwan is no longer part of China. Uh, taking $300 million of the state's gold reserves with him, and also all of its, or not all, probably not all of it, but a, as much art <coughs> that he could carry. Um, and also, but during the war, I should also point out that many of the, um, the generals in Chiang Kai-shek's army actually sold American weapons onto the Chinese Communist Party to make some money. Um, so basically, they were a class that realized their time was up. I don't think they really had much of a... Uh, belief in their struggle they they just wanted to make some money essentially and they gave up the fights pretty quickly um, but nevertheless we have to say despite all of my criticisms the Chinese Communist Party did win and of course it was an absolutely epic and heroic uh, struggle uh, so you might conclude well this is, was ultimately justified uh, and in a sense it, it, it was in the, the country did take enormous strides afterwards which we will we'll discuss but also it came with a big big price the reason that we're against um, making guerrilla warfare the main method of struggle in revolutions is not just because it's dangerous and you're unlikely to win and, and, and you'll get wiped out, uh, but it's also because um, it's no basis for establishing a healthy workers' democracy, which is what you need to build socialism. You can't build socialism on a top-down basis from a bureaucracy. That is the lesson of Stalinism. And that was made inevitable by coming to power in this way. Because if you think about it, first of all, they're basing themselves on what? On the peasantry. The peasantry, you might think, is the rural equivalent of the working class because it's very, very poor. Uh, but it isn't really. The peasantry I I is a scattered and a heterogeneous class. Whereas the working class lives in big cities and works in, in large workplaces collectively, um, the peasantry generally has its own pri private plots of land. Uh, they live in a very scattered and far away way. The means of communication are very, very poor. It's very, very hard to travel anywhere to have like a mass meeting of peasants, for example. Um, and um, actually their interests are different because you we call them the peasantry as if they're one class, but actually there's rich and poor peasants. There's an enormous amount of social stratification in the peasantry. Uh, in most countries. So many people that are called peasants actually would be relatively well off by their standards and would employ uh, landless peasants on their farms. And of course then you have the landless peasants who obviously are more like the working class because they, they don't have any property. So it's a heterogeneous class it's an, and it's a scattered class. That makes it um, politically impotent. Uh, and all of history has shown this, that the peasantry can play a very, very important role with the weight of numbers by backing one side or another in revolutions and in wars. But they're not uh, able to play an independent political role for the reasons I've outlined. They can't have mass meetings. They can't really form effective trade unions and, and hold their leaders to account when they've got divergent interests and when they live so far apart. And also, of course, um, the Red Army had to occupy different bits of territory and they would move from one place to another quite quickly in order to evade the Guomindang when it was attempting to wipe them out. And they actually had to get fed by the peasants. So th there are actually some cases where the Communist Party had to leave areas because the peasants got fed up with them, because the peasants were having to feed themselves and the Red Army. Uh, but also they, would, they, you know, they were armed to the teeth, obviously, and they were moving from territory to territory. So that also makes it very difficult to exercise any kind of democratic control over this Red Army and this Communist Party. If they just move into your territory one week, you know, uninvited, because they've got to, because they're fighting to survive, and they, they've got a lot of weapons, you're not really in a position to uh, establish a democratic structure and recall members of the Communist Party and put different people in, in their place. It's just not, not viable. And then they would leave again quite quickly afterwards uh, um, in order for, you know, for military purposes. So, it was impossible to have any real democratic control over the leadership. And therefore, it was a, as you would expect from a military, it was a very top-down, commandist kind of structure, uh, used to issuing orders and getting what it wants. And of course, it came into the cities in 1949 as kind of a foreign power to the workers, you know, as something that was very alien to them. Most workers did support it because they despised the, the, the regime. They did welcome it, but they were very passive. They hadn't staged their own revolution. 
in which they'd created their own uh, organs of struggle, like workers' councils, you know, factory committees, you know, and, and, and defensive organisations of struggle and, and strike, strike committees and all the rest of it. They hadn't done that because there hadn't been that kind of revolution. So the working class wasn't organised. It didn't have its own leaders, its own structures, really. And then suddenly this incredibly powerful military force comes into the city that is used to issuing orders and getting what it wants. Naturally, of course, uh, it was not really something that the working class could hold to account. And indeed, when the workers did, after the Communist Party came to power, when the workers did attempt to form their own democratic organisations, their own uh, trade unions or have strikes, the Communist Party put them down pretty quickly. Uh, and of course, also, you have to add that they were modelling themselves on Stalin's Russia. So naturally, it was, uh, it was also, for that reason as well, inclined to go in a Stalinist direction. However, actually, when they first came to power, they didn't do so with the idea of ending capitalism. And I've already explained how throughout the course of the revolution, their position was one of basically um, supporting the bourgeoisie uh, or the so-called national bourgeoisie, the sort of progressive liberal bourgeoisie. Their position was, I guess, a little bit like if, if uh, um, well, in fact, it was very much like a lot of the Labour Party's positions in a sense that it was essentially a coalition with like the Remainers, the sort of liberal bourgeois against the right wing kind of bourgeois. It's kind of a position like that, essentially. Those were, that was kind of, they, they said that we support the, the, the liberal progressive bourgeoisie. That was their position up until taking power. And when they did take power, they continued that position. Uh, they called it new democracy, actually. Uh, and this is how they described it. Um, they said, it is a law of Marxism that socialism can be attained only via the stage of democracy, meaning bourgeois democracy. And in China, the fight for democracy is a protracted one. It would be a sheer illusion to try to build a socialist society on the ruins of colonial uh, semi-feudal order without a united new democratic state, without the development of the state sector of this economy and of the private capitalist and cooperative sectors. Liu Xiaoqi also elaborated, he said, the immediate policy of the Communist Party is to realize completely its minimum program. It is known that the Communist Party of China has in addition to its minimum program, a maximum program, which is not included, which means socialism, which is not included in the common program. Now, in the course of consultation, some delegates, and this is quite interesting, proposed to write the future socialism of China into the common program, that is their program for power. But we deem this to be out of place because the taking of serious socialist steps in China is a thing of the far, far future. They also um, issued uh, flattery towards the United States. For example, they said China must industrialize. This can be done in China only by free enterprise and with the aid of foreign capital. Chinese and American interests are correlated and similar. They fit together economically and politically. The United States would find us more cooperative than the Guomindang were. We will not be afraid of democratic American influence. In fact, we welcome it. That was their initial policy. And for the first four years after taking power, they uh, helped um, uh, capitalism, actually. So what happened? Why then did they turn uh, and abolish capitalism, which really started in 1953? Well, basically because, again, they didn't anticipate how counter-revolutionary the bourgeoisie is, in particular, in this case, the international bourgeoisie. They had this naive idea. Um, I don't know to what extent they necessarily actually believed it, but it's what they put forward, that um, we can kind of win the bourgeoisie to us by flattering them and offering them sweet deals and things. Um, but ver various things happened. The US basically blockaded China uh, because it couldn't tolerate the, you know, the biggest country in the world being under the control of the Communist Party. And it was called the Communist Party and it had close relations with the Soviet Union. The Cold War was beginning. They weren't going to allow that to happen. Um, so they blockaded them and that kind of forced them in a certain direction. There was also the Korean War, which sort of t pushed everything to the left because America was fighting against communists right on their doorstep. And so that also drew, helped them to draw the conclusion they needed to move away from capitalism and to shore up their own industry by kind of nationalizing things. But also ba the, the reality of the, the, the Chinese capitalist class, most of them had actually fled to Taiwan with, with, or certainly of the big capitalists, had fled to Taiwan with Chiang Kai-shek. And actually they nationalized the property of the big capitalists that were around Chiang Kai-shek right from the beginning. That was always their idea to nationalize the, his associates' property. But in doing so, they discovered they'd actually nationalized four-fifths of China's industry um, because it was concentrated in very few hands. 
Um, and they, they then tried to run it as a sort of ca nationalized capitalist uh, entity, but they ended up, by 1953, basically going with a plan of production. Um, and there was also another reason for it, which is in many respects similar to the reason that Britain nationalized a lot of things after the Second World War. The economy was absolutely wrecked by the war. And you needed, to be honest, massive state intervention and protectionism to help build it up, which is a big part of the reason that... Um, my time is up, I assume. That, um, uh, have a couple more minutes. That, um, that Attlee and then even after him, conservatives actually nationalized quite a lot of things. That's part of the reason anyway. We should say that after they did so, the initial results were extremely good. The first five-year plan in 53 uh, onwards to, to, to 58 uh, was a huge success. Wages rose by a third. Life expectancy increased from 36 to 57 in only eight years. The number of children in school doubled and housing improved massively. There was a massive program of, of, social house, of the building of social housing in the cities and in the countryside. And you have to remember that China was pretty much the poorest country in the world in 1949. Um, and there were many pro-working class and progressive policies. They ended casual labor, uh, actually from 1949 onwards. Uh, they did grant a lot of land reform to poor peasants. And they granted women absolutely transformational rights that they had. I mean, the role of women in, in Chinese society beforehand was incredibly, incredibly oppressed. Uh, they ended foot binding, for example. They, they abolished the buying and selling of wives um, and, and made it far easier to, for women to divorce their husbands, which were huge steps forward. So we have to pay homage to these sacrifices that were, sorry, these um, victories that were gained through the enormous sacrifices of literally millions of, of people. Uh, who fought in this epic, epic struggle between the counter-revolutionary Chiang Kai-shek and the Communist Party. Uh, this immense hardship, they did transform the country. And I would say they laid the basis for the current success of, of China, admittedly Chinese capitalism. But by est establishing a strong state apparatus free of, 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 an, of the domination of imperialism, they laid the basis for that as well. However, ultimately, the fact that they didn't establish a workers' democracy uh, in this way, for the reasons I've described, the fact that it was a bureaucratic dictatorship wasn't just, you know, an unpleasant thing in many ways, didn't just cause a, a lot, and I should say there were a lot, as, while there were successes of the planned economy, there were absolutely staggering mistakes uh, and appalling things that ca were carried out that led to the deaths of millions. Um, but as well as that, the, 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 the inability to build socialism without democracy in a top-down way has led to the present restoration of capitalism uh, in China uh, and all the evils of capitalism that have come back with that.